Good evening. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'm delighted to welcome you all to tonight's Infrastructure Thought Leaders series on precast construction with double wall. Firstly, in keeping with our tradition, Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to their cultures and to elders past, present and emerging. My name is Amanda Rogers, National Corporate Engagement Manager at Engineers Australia and I will be your host for tonight. Widely used in commercial construction throughout Europe, thanks to its many benefits in engineering, design and construction, Double Wall is a permanent formwork precast building system which enables the creation of monolithic structures. Tonight you will hear from two engineering experts who will discuss innovation in double wall construction, key features and benefits, and discuss local and international case studies. The two presentations will be followed by a Q&A session at the end, so I ask if you can please hold your questions until then. You'll be able to send through your questions via the chat box on the screen during this period. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that tonight's seminar is being hosted with our long-standing industry partner, Austral Precast. Austral Precast is a leading provider of high quality and innovative custom precast concrete production solutions. Operating from plants located across Australia using state-of-the-art technology, production techniques and system, Austral Precast produces a diversified range of customised products and specific precast solutions. Austral Precast services a range of markets including multi-residential, commercial, industrial, community and civil sectors. I would now like to welcome our first speaker, Matthew Murray. Matthew is the Engineering and Estimating Manager at Austral Precast and one of Australia's leading experts on the double wall system. Having worked with countless clients on various projects and range from tunnels, like the M5 tunnel project in Sydney, to high rise buildings, Matthew has developed an intimate understanding of the double wall product and how it can be used to improve engineering design and construction timelines. Please welcome Matthew Murray. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, today we're here as part of the Infrastructure Thought Leader Series to present Precast Construction with Double Wall. I'm Matthew Murray, the Engineering Manager at Austral Precast and I'm heavily involved with the development of Double Wall right from the plant through to the technical design and specification, through to delivery and implementation. So for those of you who aren't uh, familiar with um, Austral Precast, we're part of the Brickworks Building Products Company. It's a strong national business with manufacturing plants and display centres located in all states of Australia. In total, there are 33 manufacturing plants and more than 27 display centres and design studios across the country. Um, and this is backed up by an extensive reseller network as well for our standard building products. Um, geographically, Brickworks is spread all across Australia with sales revenue approximately in proportion to the building activity and a large build, broad portfolio of products uh, providing diverse market segments, including detached housing, multi-res and non-residential building. So first up, I'll just give you guys a brief introduction of Double from uh, one of our videos. Build with confidence with Austral Precast Double Wall a permanent formwork system that brings quality, efficiency and flexibility to any construction project. Double Wall uniquely combines the advantages of precast construction together with the engineering benefits of in situ construction, fast and economical site processes, yet with flexibility for individual planning and architectural objectives. Double Wall is the perfect solution for today's construction needs. Austral Precast Double Wall consists of a pair of precast reinforced concrete shells forming a cavity 
and connected by a lattice girder fabricated from reinforcement bar. Double wall is finished with joints and corners that minimize the need for on-site caulking, welding and formwork. Provisions for formwork with doorways and windows, electrical, cable, air conditioning and plumbing conduits are fully customizable. And overall wall thickness can vary between 180 mm to 400 mm, depending on each project's individual structure and applied load requirements. On-site, Double Wall's hollow wall design structure allows for easier installation due to reduced weight crane loads. When cavities are filled with premixed concrete, Double Wall forms a strong and solid concrete structure. And unlike other permanent formwork systems, Double Wall has the added advantage of being installed with reinforcing for structural loads already incorporated into the product, eliminating 90% of the on-site steel fixing ordinarily required on-site. The results are ready to paint perfect facades where smooth surfaces are achieved on both inner and outer walls. Austral Precast Double Wall is your ideal solution for stairs, lift shafts and basement walls, facades, cladding and retaining walls, functional partitions, noise, fire and sound barriers. And with the advantages of watertight construction and excellent thermal performance, Build with confidence with Austral Precast Double Wall, the smart and efficient permanent formwork system. Okay, so what exactly is Double Wall? It's a permanent formwork system that has the quality and efficiency, and efficiency advantages of Precast, together with engineering benefits of in situ construction. So on the left hand side here, we can see a pretty typical uh, floor, wall and floor system in as in situ construction. So on the left hand side, we can essentially see in section the wall with the main reinforcement bars highlighted in red and the starter bars in brown. On the right hand side, we can see the same wall as a double wall. The main reinforcement is in each shell and each shell is connected by the green lattice skirter you can see here. So the Lattice girder connects the two shells together and most of the reinforcement that is in the wall is already placed in the factory in the precast plant made from a mesh machine. On site, the only steel that needs to be placed is the starter bars with um, the provision to be made that they fit inside the core and the joint reinforcement connecting from panel to panel. So double wall is a structural wall. The shell thickness thickness typically go from 55 to 70 millimetres. The core that gets core filled on site has a minimum of 70 mil thickness. So the reason why we choose this, this number is so that essentially we have enough room for the starter bars to go into the core on site and to make sure there's enough tolerances there. Um, the concrete that typically goes into the core is usually a 40 MPA as depending upon the wall specification. 10 mil aggregate and 180 millimeter slump. The precast shells are manufactured in 50 MPA in our factory, uh, but the minimum concrete strength that is put in the wall, be it either in the precast or in the core, is the minimum strength that should be used for the design. Uh, the reinforcement is all included in the precast shells. So through the usual uh, shop drawing process, the design reinforcement that comes from the in-situ design will be incorporated into the double wall shells. That is drawn in a 3D model in 3D model in Tecla from Austral. And from there, it goes through the usual IFA and IFC design procedure process. And once that panel has been made, has been, has been, has been specified, it gets sent to the factory as per the drawing. The uh, lattice girders that you can see here on the right hand side, uh, what connects the two shells together? and all the inserts are included in the double wall. So here we can see the lifting hooks are already cast in in the factory and any other inserts such as uh, for propping ferrules or for connecting to other items uh, can be installed in the factory. Uh, double wall can be manufactured from 170 millimeters right up to 400 millimeters. And this is largely governed by the thickness of the shells and the core for essentially how small we can go at the 170 millimeter end right up to the 400 millimeter end, which is governed by the maximum uh, girder that can be manufactured by existing equipment.
Um, our pallet casting size enables us to cast panels up to 3.5 metres by 13.2 metres, and they can be orientated either as horizontal or vertical and rotated on site. And typical mass of the panels ranges from 265 kilograms per square metre to 375 kilograms per square metre, and that is largely dependent upon the shell thickness and the reinforcement in the panel. So the major advantage here of double wall is that regardless of the thickness of the of the panel, it is of overall thickness of the wall, it is typically the same mass. So a 200 mil thick double wall with 70 mil shells would have the same mass as a 400 mil thick double wall with 70 mil shells. The only difference would be the girder reinforcement across the core, which there might be, which there will be a slightly more amount with a 400 mil thick panel. Um, but essentially you'd be looking at that same 350 kilograms per square meter for a 70 mil shell thickness. So how do we manufacture double wall? Essentially there's, there's three stages. The first stage is to uh, cast the first shell. So the first shell you hear in stage one has the 70 mil biscuit, the bar mat, and the girders in that shell. That is then, that is poured and then cured until it reaches 20 MPA. Once 20 MPA has been reached in the curing chamber, shell one comes out and is in, inverted over shell two. So shell two here at the bottom has essentially fresh concrete. Shell one is then lowered into shell two, vibrated and put into the curing chamber until it reaches 25 MPA to go to site. So here's an example of how we manufacture the double wall. Here we can see shell one that was poured yesterday. So this panel here would be a minimum of 20 MPA. It's um, got all the reinforcement already cast into that 70 mil shell of concrete. And here we have the U-bars on either side as part of the connection for panel to panel. The girders you can see here up the center of the panel are essentially for connecting the two shells together. And then down the side of each of down the side of each each side of the pallet here we have the clamps. So these clamps are essentially a steel bar that has a hydraulic with a pivot uh, section here. So the hydraulic pushes up on the end of the bar, forcing the end that's on the concrete to hold to clamp the panel to the pallet. Subsequently, we can then take that pallet and lift it up vertically. So the panel we were just looking at is now, we're now looking at the bottom of that pallet overhead in the shot. And underneath we have just poured the second shell. So this second shell here um, has a reinforcement in it with a uh, deck rail or bar chairs for setting the correct cover for the panel. And on the pallet here, we have these tapered pins, which allow us to locate the shell one pallet when it's inverted into the panel. So to show you how that process works, here, here's a video. The first shell is right inverted 180 degrees and lowered into the second shell. So the key thing to see here is that these pins here are what locates the, the pallet. So the alignment of the formwork shutters that you can see here, these steel shutters, which are placed by our formwork robot, is very critical. And all of that comes directly from our Tecla 3D models. So the information for every panel gets downloaded to our plant computer, which then essentially manufactures the mesh or the bar mat for the uh, panel. It also locates the shuttering for the panel. So we have the correct shuttering first time. Uh, direct from the from the model, which is as drawn in our shop drawings. Once that panel is lowered into the second shell, the clamps are released and the table is all vibrated together. So this whole bed vibrates, so there's no need for any manual vibration with people using snakes and or manual vib vibration, and that ensures uh, consistency of the concrete. Okay, so here we can see the clamps have been released, the panel has been vibrated, and it is then left to go into the curing chamber. 
Once the second shell has reached uh, 20 MPa, it can then be put into lifted into storage. So here we see those panels that we were just looking at uh, being placed into storage. So one of the key components for manufacture in the carousel plant is that we have a tilt table. So all our panels are lifted, are tilted to 85 degrees um, by the by the machine before just being lifted vertically off the table when we're when we're stripping from the pallet. Um, one major advantage of that is we don't induce any shear force into the panel, so the quality of concrete is uh, very good straight from the factory, and it also means that um, all of our all of our cast-in fitments and everything else uh, all come out correct from the, from the factory. On the right-hand side here, we can see these exact panels being installed here at the uh, Equinex sites. Um, so these panels here were being used for a tank, for a data story, for a data center. So what's the typical construction sequence? Um, so once panels have been shop drawn and approved, the slab is then poured on site uh, with the starter bars laid out um, essentially to, to have alignment with the girders. So one key component is the girders can clash with the starter bars. So it's a uh, good practice to have the site cast the starter bars with 150 mil clearance from the nominal center of the girder uh, with grouping the starter bars in locations away from that. This just helps us ensure that this site um, installs panels at a much faster rate than, than otherwise, and also um, reduces the chance of the site requiring to have to, res resisting the chance for the site having to cut any bars um, for installation. So that's a prudent process to follow and has what we found to be the best for site. So once the panels have been landed, they're propped and the panel to panel joint reinforcement can be placed before the subsequent panel is put into place. Once all the walls are put into place, the walls are then poured. So here we can see the cross section to show where the core fill is actually going into the panel. Um, so one of the key things here is we're using a 180 slump 10 mil ag um, just so that there's good flow of concrete into the center of the core and the other thing to note is most of the reinforcement is already in each panel there's only the lattice girder at roughly 300 to 600 mil centers in the center and that significantly reduces the chance of having any voids in the panel Okay, so how do we design double wall? Under current um, regulations, we have our technical manual available straight off the website uh, in line with AS3600 2018, AS3610 for formwork, and AS3850 for precast elements. Um, where there's no Australian standard available, uh, we refer to the European regulations. So uh, one of the key things for double wall with casting such a thin shell is the tolerances. So uh, we'll speak about this shortly, but the main thing there is we want to make sure we have enough cover for our girders and that is critical to the manufacture of double wall. Uh, another thing we're borrowing from the European regulation is the pouring rates. So uh, there's been some testing done in Europe with regards to the girder set out and the maximum pouring rates possible. So pour, both pouring height and speed. Uh, dependent upon the girder cover and the temperature of the site. Uh, lifting specification has been borrowed from the European lifters. Um, the main difference here is that they use a three times factor of safety and not a 2.25 times factor of safety as per the Australian standard. So under um, essential prudent, prudent design, we've borrowed the European factor of safety um, just so we don't have any issues. Other points where there are is the principles of calculation. So for instance, um, the calculating the shear at the interface uh, of the two different concretes, uh, specific for double wall is specified in the European regulation uh, where we currently don't have it available under AS3600. Uh, other things available in the technical manual are specific details when it comes to boundary elements, joint details, and also um, finishing details of the joint, so whether that needs to be corked, grouted, and other. 
Okay, so to make it a bit easier for design, the technical manual has some standard sizing tables. So one of the keys for double wall is this picture on the left here shows the minimum internal cover for the girder. So the girder dictates essentially the transport and core filling of the panel. Um, so this internal cover here, we require a minimum of 15 millimetres. So depending upon our expo exposure classification, be it a B1 at 20 millimetres for precast or B2 at 25 millimetres, that in conjunction with the horizontal reinforcement will then dictate the minimum shell thickness required. So that's really critical for us um, for determining both for the different size of panel, what we can actually uh, manufacture safely for core filling, as well as for making sure we have enough room on site for the for the starter bars and joint connections. Um, some other things that we've provided as part of the technical manual are some uh, load capacity tables. So essentially here we can see um, the reinforcement ratios required as per AS 3600 uh, section 11.7.1. .1. Um, so here we, this is just one example, we have a few different tables available to make reference easy for, from a design perspective. Um, here we're using the um, standard reinforcement as per AS3600, so we can make our bar mats using N-grade uh, reinforcement. So the bar mats are made direct off our mesh machine with N-grade coil, and that can obviously then help with the capacity reduction factors. So here we're using uh, 0.8 uh, for N-grade and not 0.65 if we were doing, say, an L-grade mesh. Okay, so another critical part for design is um, the compressive section of the wall. So double wall differs to standard precast in the fact that we are core filling. And with core filling, um, essentially we have concrete going into the core and being in contact with the slab. So typical precast will have either a 10 or 20 mil uh, spacer, um, but for that, if we are core filling and we're just using a, sp a spacer and no, no mortar, then essentially we can't guarantee that there's concrete between the, co between the precast shells and the, and the slab. So in this case, on the left-hand side, the compressive strength of the wall would actually only be using the core section uh, because of that reduced gap and not being able to get aggregate and as part of the concrete underneath the precast shell. If when we get to site, there is an issue and we can't um, achieve a larger gap underneath the base of the panel. It is possible to use a non-shrink mortar that can be placed before or after the, the panel is placed on site. And when that um, is achieved, we can then use the entire compressive section of the wall for the compressive strength. Our preferred, however, is to use the example here on the right-hand side. Here we're using 30 mil spacers as our nominal spacer underneath the panel. And in that case, once it's core filled, concrete can get underneath the panel. And here we just have the 75 by 35 mil timbers to ensure that the concrete doesn't actually leak out from the panel during, during um, core filling. But then we can use the entire strength in compression and don't have to rely on grout. So I think we're all aware of the um, issues with grouting on site recently um, and by doing using this method it's I think a far more robust and repeatable way of achieving the design intent on for the wall. Okay so other um, places where we've uh, utilized the European specification is particularly within regards to the joint shear capacity. Um, so on the left hand side here we can see in plan view, looking from above, two panels that are meeting. So everything in blue you can see is cast into the panel. And on the right hand, in the center there, we have this orange hairpin, or it could be two meshes, which are placed in the core. So one of the keys here is if the wall um, is undergoing shear, then we can essentially calculate the in-plane in shear capacity 
of the reinforcement uh, just by essentially looking at the single section only. So here we'd be looking at on the left-hand side, purely can, can this single assembly transfer the shear through the core? And the key part here is the dot, the dash lines you can see. So there'll be the shear interface from the precast to the core, as well as the shear capacity across across the section. Now, when that capacity is, is not enough to achieve the design intent, uh, a common method is to stitch the joint. So here we cast in a U-bar. Um, for this U-bar, the way the designers have drawn it looks a little bit short, but we can achieve essential full lapping of the bar mat to the U-bar as per standard AS3600 requirements. Um, and then what we have here essentially is this, this hairpin here with vertical reinforcement placed to complete the section. Uh, one of the key components here is when we're looking at the um, coefficients of friction, we use the same coefficients as per AS3600 um, of C and U. So typically a 0.2 and 0.6 will be for a smooth um, connection. So what that means is the interface between the precast and the and the core fill is considered to be a smooth connection. So whilst we place and vibrate the precast in the factory, we don't screed or trowel it. So we have a essentially a, a, a fairly rough surface. Um, but when it comes to design, we still assume, assume it to be smooth and that way we're being conservative for the capacity of the joint. Uh, so when it also comes to design, the key key component for double wall is what are, what is the pouring rate that needs to be achieved on site. So here we can see the cross section of the double wall with the essentially the internal cover to the girders, and dependent upon the temperature and also the spacing of the girders, we can then achieve different pour rates. So what this rate is here is how fast per hour we can pour. So Different sites will have different requirements, um, particularly when we have very high walls of say 10, 12 meters, the guys want to want to pour as much as possible. Um, but what this will this what this will tell us is we can essentially pour here at uh, just around one meter per hour if the temperature is only 10 degrees and we had 15 mil cover for that section. So the rates can increase as the as the cover increases, but also as the girder spacing increases. So you can see a massive difference here between 300 mil space girders versus four and 500 mil space spacing of the girders. Um, connections. So most critical part for double is the connection from panel to panel or panel to other um, structures. So. Here essentially we have at what we call a hinge connection. So where we're only doing a 10 mil joint, uh, we'll typically only have a hinge connection. So here essentially, depending upon how the how the wall is behaving, will dictate if we can get away with a hinge connection or not. Um, so for simple walls, say where we're replacing um, block work or non non load bearing walls, uh, we're typically going for a hinge connection. And also for small walls where we might have them all stitched together as a box. When we're going for a fixed connection, um, this will be dictated by the requirements of, of the site. So on the left hand side here, we can see the bottom of panel connection to a slab. So this fixed fixed connection here essentially is commonly used uh, if we were had a if we we're building a tank that was holding water internally. So the difference here is having the U-bar reinforcement helps stitch it all together, but also these panels here are actually placed before pouring of this section of the slab. So that allows us to have concrete continuous through the slab and into the base of the panel, which then also reduces the chance of any uh, cold joints for a tank. In the middle here, um, we can see a typical bottom of panel connection for a cantilevered retaining wall. So the difference here is the orange U-bar at the bottom of the panel helps stitch the uh, joint together. So essentially what we're trying to do 
it in increased the capacity of the joint due to having the U-bar crossing the interface between the precast and the core fill. And by doing that, um, essentially we can increase the capacity of the joint. And a main consideration here to note also is the distance from the outside face to the starter bar is uh, critical for cantilever retaining walls and should be taken into consideration during the design. Um, when it comes to fixed connections, so here we have some connections that are fairly typical of a, say, a core wall or similar. Um, so main difference here is we have these U-bars cast into the end of each panel with a stirrup placed on site. So here we can do this connection both vertically and horizontally, um, but care must be considered for the how they're going to put it together on site and particularly for access. Joint treatment. So panels can be uh, treated just as pure standard precast that's shown on the right hand side. So here we have a backing rod and corking. Um, so essentially here, this is for an external application above ground. Um, but on the left hand side here, we can see an external wall against the earth. So we're looking in plan from above. This is the outside shell against the earth. And two key things we're doing here is we're applying a bituminous impregnated foam cord to the first panel that's placed on the left before landing the panel on the right. And we also can increase the specification of the cover internally. Um, so here we've increased the cover from a standard 15 mil to 30 mil, just to ensure that uh, we have enough concrete between the connecting reinforcement and the external shell. So what projects have we done in the last couple of years? So first project here was the first double wall project um, other than our own batching plant where we, we put in some uh, basement panels. Here, Wynyard Walk is the um, station in the centre of Sydney where essentially all the boundary walls internally were done as a 400 thick double wall. And uh, from all accounts, that was a very good application. Uh, other projects we've completed uh, for Equinix SY5 data centre in Mascot. So for this building here shown on the right, we did the tank panels uh, shown in the image on the left, as well as um, panels that allowed us to be integrated with the uh, column. So we had a column with a wet joint connection to the double wall as a shear, as a shear, shear wall. And uh, that was a very good application because it removes all welding for the shear walls internally, um, as they're all done with double wall and interfacing to the to the columns. Uh, another project that Ravi will talk about later is um, Smalls Road Public School for Richard Crooks. So here we're doing uh, triple height core wall panels. Um, so one of the things here to consider is being triple height panels that you can obviously see there's quite a lot of propping uh, in the design, as well as might be able to see here the connection reinforcement has been actually placed in the panel prior to landing the second panel, uh, just for the ease of the site. So that was a very in interesting application um, and definitely one where we're keen to do more core walls in the future through our learnings from that project. Another significant project was the uh, WestConnex M5 for CPB. Uh, so here, essentially, we have a structure that's um, the exhaust ventilation stack uh, at Arncliffe. So underneath this here is essentially two very large holes that this box that is 12 metres high is uh, manufactured out of double and straddles over the void. So we actually have two deep beams uh, operating on either opposite end of the uh, double wall. But the key thing to see here as well is we have the stitch joints, so essentially a, a fixed joint, but we've also integrated the double wall with buttress columns. So this essentially enables the building to be constructed much quicker because all of the voids for the Z bars were put into the double wall and with the piriform work system then placed on site reinforcement dropped in the core for the uh, formwork, 
before being filled. So that's um, significantly increased the um, construction time or significantly increased the construction speed, sorry, of the site with the double wall section essentially taking uh, one quarter of the time to manufacture and, and install in comparison to the in situ site. So this is uh, the almost finished section here of the double walls for the same site with all, all panels being propped outside. So the photo here um, might be hard to tell, but these, these walls are actually 12 metres high and it's a very impressive job for them to be able to do it in the conditions they did on site. Uh, other applications are here is a basement wall. Um, so we completed a basement wall for the University of Sydney for Langer Rock. Um, so double wall is able to be used as a basement wall either against the existing earth boundary or can be core filled and backfilled later, just depending upon the application. Um, so double wall is a very good application for, for retaining walls, be them can fully cantilevered. And now we also have an option for using with uh, GeoGrid. Uh, other projects we've completed here, we have a uh, the Military Vehicle Centre of Excellence for Wattpack in Queensland. So the panels were uh, designed by GHD or in, con in conjunction with GHD um, purely to solve the problem where we have a tank manufacturing facility that required essentially two concrete uh, skins or two a twin tunnel, so to speak, so that when the uh, tank was manufactured, it can then um, progress down the assembly line and the firing cannon be tested in this tunnel. So the main advantages here of using double wall is that they had six metre high walls uh, with a hollow core slab across the top. And essentially we had about 50 mils clearance from the internal wall to the external double wall, um, which allowed the insulation and other requirements for the acoustic side to be, to be made and significantly reduce their construction speed. Another good application here is um, once again up against a boundary wall. So here's the uh, Sydney Airport Holiday Inn Express, or the, for what we call HIEX for ADCO. So the panels here are both acting as a boundary wall, but also as a shear wall. So we have approximately 50 mil clearance from the boundary wall to the existing building next door. And this wall is also one of the primary shear wall for the building. Um, so it's a really good application and hats off to the guys who works on that project because they did a really good job. Um, here's another project for Astina Apartments in Penrith. So here the panels are being used as an external wall um, with, this, with the top shutter here being higher for the slab. So once these panels are placed and core filled, the slab is then poured into the, into the core. So there's no external shuttering or formwork for the slab. So you essentially have a nice hidden slab edge for the site and we can achieve the engineering requirements there. Another application here, just a top view of showing uh, lift and stair core walls. So double wall can, is essentially a permanent formwork system that can be used in many applications. Um, here for the stair, and co stair core walls, it's um, a really good application because here essentially we're going putting some very high walls in in a much faster fashion and we can also achieve the continuity for the core and the requirements under AS3600 for the boundary elements. Uh, so here's some basement walls um, with probably a better view showing down against, against the existing wall. So you can see here we can really make use of the existing boundary line. And the other thing as well is double wall can be used um, in situations where we have um, essentially the wall being below the water table and the tightness of the of the wall can essentially withstand 20 metres of waterhead. So there's a few different uh, ways of us achieving that, um, but it's a much faster application and really good for doing um, OSD tanks amongst other tank walls. Uh, retaining walls. So here we show an example of a cantilever, cantilever retaining wall. So you have your footing design, which is very similar to a standard cantilever retaining wall. Uh, installing the panels and propping them. So depending upon the site, 
we can just use temporary blocks if required. The panels are then core filled and backfilled before the props are removed and the site is completed. So here's another example of a uh, retaining wall. Um, so you can see here, we can have a significant reduction in the um, in the removal of earth um, because the double wall system is, is very fast and very safe application. Another good application for the double wall is uh, with the use of double wall and austral deck or transfloor, as some of you may, might be familiar with. Um, so this allows very fast construction, both for the walls and the and the floors, and is very good not just for warehouses in this situation, but also for um, multi-res construction as well. So in a nutshell, double wall is a permanent formwork system with the quality and efficiency of precast, together with the engineering benefits of in-situ construction. We have an off two, class two off-form finish on each face, which is ready for prep and painting. Uh, improved construction efficiency, so the design is co directly converted from the in-situ design. Uh, all the reinforcements incorporated in the factory, re reduce trades and hot works on site, and we meet all the requirements under AS3600, so fire, acoustics, um, all of those sort of requirements are as per AS3600. Uh, as far as the BCA is concerned, double wall is also um, treated purely as a single skin concrete wall um, with essentially no issues with fire or any any risk with uh, the PCAs or certifiers um, as, as compared to other systems. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Matthew, for your presentation. I'd now like to welcome our second speaker, Ravi Salatura, Associate Structural Engineer at SCP Consulting. Ravi has worked with SCP Consulting for 14 years. He was the end-to-end -end team leader on the Smalls Road Public School project and was responsible for detailed design, development and documentation, attending consultant client meetings and coordinating builders' queries during the construction stage. Please join me in welcoming Ravi. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for registering and attending this um, Seminar Infrastructure Thought Leader Series. This is a part two of the seminar, Construction of Hostel Precast Double Wall in Small Road Public School. So I will go through um, quickly through that um, uh, construction sequence um, of the, this uh, project. So Small Road Public School. Um, so so uh, project team is a, this is a, like a design and construction, um, Claire and uh, New South Wales. Um, Department of Education, uh, School Infrastructure. Contact is uh, Richard Kuru Construction, DN, like a DNC Construction. Architect, Conrad Gargett uh, and Collard Maxwell Architect. Structural Engineer, SCP Consulting in collaboration with the Alta Flow. Civil Engineer, SCP Consulting and construction value around 38 million. Introduction of the new building, um, Small Road Public School, um, is an innovative new school developed by school infrastructure. The project was delivered as a DNC contract with the Richard Crew Construction and is located on the former Wright High School ground. The school building itself uh, is a three-story circular uh, concrete structure designed to support up to 1,000 children with uh, 70 staff and completed um, by December 2019 and was ready to open term one 2020. Project brief, uh, SCP was asked to join the project by lead contractor Richard Kuru Construction and take over the design from previous engineer um, at a tender design stage. We were then asked um, to ensure that the school was delivered on time um, with a budget. So in the school was uh, to consist multi-purpose sports school, cola, library, and 43 learning spaces. So in the building was required to, de to be delivered to a tight project timeline, um, which required the construction team to achieve structural completion under a year, probably around seven months. 
So for that, SCP decided um, to think outside the box by maximizing the use of prefabricated elements in the design response, including the large precast mega beam with ultra flow infill slab. That was like a DNC um, construction, uh, level one, level two suspended slab, and double wall precast panel for replacing all in situ core walls. And also a few number of uh, rebuild height precast column uh, we used uh, uh, where the assembly um, areas. This is a um, site um, plan and uh, you can see the circular building uh, showing that's a small road. Um, this is a grid set out by architect and you can see the right hand side is a um, circular building is divided into the six block and plus um, assembly area. And between each block, um, there, there were uh, break areas up here to get in and go out. This is a um, typical architectural uh, plan layout. Um, you can see that um, um, stair or lift core walls and each block showing um, between the break area. So fully part plans um, joining. So the key structural element and what are the changes we made uh, from original tender design to design and construction um, stage. The foundation original tender design is a pile foundation. Um, we changed to 50% pile foundation and 50% pad footing bearing on same material where a high level of rock uh, were present. Retaining wall original design, 190 reinforced core fill block work. We changed to 200 AFS ready wall for faster construction. Ground floor conventional suspended slab, RC, um, suspended RC concrete slab with beams supported by the piles. So in DNC states, what we did, we changed um, a suspended slab into slab on ground with a void format to external edge where the reactive clay was present. Level one and two um, original design was post tension floor slab with a low hundred deep uh, beam along column crates. DNC we changed with um, in collaboration with the ultra flow with the precast mega beam along column crates and um, secondary B250 UC secondary beams um, and infill ultra flow slab. Roof original design the metal a metal roof with a normal structural steel framing. Um, we changed uh, it to metal roof with a lightweight steel framing um, like a DNC by Ostras. Column uh, original design conventionally formed RC columns. Um, then we introduced combination of conventionally formed and preformed in situ columns for faster construction. And also, as I said previously, a few number of um, 12 meter high Rockla precast column also we used. Core walls. Uh, so it's a, it's a conventionally formed RC wall original design. Then we um, introduced um, in collaboration with Ostal precast um, full height precast panels. Design and construction process. And the key driver for the construction program was to ensure the school was fitted out and ready to open by term one. So our first design meeting was started um, around 2018 with Richard Crook. By end of January in 2019, uh, piles and pad footing insulation were completed at site. So you can see that between the first design meeting and completion of the piling, um, three months. Within three months, we have completed all construction uh, documentation by end of 2019. 2018 for the commencement of um, piling and pad footing. So then slab on ground um, have been completed around February 2019 and suspended level one and two, which was uh, designed and installed by Alta Floor with a mega beam and infill slab between mega beams. It was completed around April 19. And then the final stage is a lightweight um, steel roof structure completed around June um, 19. So you can see that within around seven months, all main structural element has been completed. Design and construction process. 
for the construction level one level two suspended slab in the ring building used to separate construction stages and methodologies so how we divided we divided into two stages of construction stage one completion of that all um, in uh, main floor slab uh, with alta flow mega beam um, and alta flow infill slab and columns stage two is the construction of uh, all um, small infill slab around the core walls and insulator and construction of hostile double wall precast panel which was insta installed as a full height panels this is a simple structural 3d modeling uh, of the building and you can see this is the one and two lift course and these are the uh, uh, rc core walls around that uh, stair and it is infill slab are used as a toilet um, uh, for the school so th this is a sim um, poor break showing each around each block uh, poor break was introduced with either with the construction joint or temporary expansion joint construction um, detail and sequence of construction quickly i will go through this um, as most of you know first uh, footing second slab on ground columns retaining walls suspended level stage one which is a uh, main floor um, uh, level one and level two um, in design and installed by alta flow stage six is a full height hostel double wall precast panel um, installed around the whole core walls four number of core walls and uh, infill all small suspended um, slab around the core walls that was a uh, stage two then final one um, was the light uh, weight roof seal structure the stage six and seven apparently occurred at site so this is a um, um, typical uh, showing the typical uh, alta flow uh, poor break and uh, poor sequence you can see that um, mega beam and then the green one showing a secondary 250 alta flow system with the infill slab so i'm um, clearly saw that um, all four core walls left out for the stage um, five construction this is the typical alta flow um, part plan layout uh, is a typical um, most of the repeated things um, so you can see along the co co grid lines so the mega beams is alone uh, around total depth of 1100 deep and between uh, secondary infill alta flow beams then um, this is, these are the area where the core walls and small infill slab which is then connecting with the main floor just a 3D showing different structural elements. Then you can see that um, just like a marker plan um, showing all core walls. As uh, you know, as as the lift and stair walls are providing permanent lateral restraint to the building, um, then um, during the checking of the old sub drawing insulation and temporary propping to full height panels have been provided by Austral. This is a floor plan again showing. Um, I am showing that uh, clearly where lift one and two, stay one and two, and stay three and four, which um, which I am going to show later slides uh, detailing how the connectivity were done. So again, what we have done, um, we we did all from part floor plans of all stay core walls or lift core walls as as so as a in situ wall what you usually do other jobs elevating the wall providing wall reinforcement as an in situ with a 220 tick wall so this is some um, um then um, the connectivity you can see type c type d which will i so which um, later slide will come then how the connectivity were made again other stay co walls um, and part plants showing other stair core four and part plants and these are the infill slab between uh, for the floor at uh, each floor level then this is the type c the construction type c block out for the stair connectivity again this is a lift one flow um, detail elevation showing and 3d and this one is the 
floor sub floor plans of the stair one. <coughs> so typical Alta floor floor plans. This is a SCP drawing and um, showing that infill slab with a few section to show um, how the connection uh, detail were done with the postal precast wall. So again, um, close up um, more detailing plan. So now um, how we did, we did a, some um, typical connection detail um, with the, um, showing that connectivity of the double wall. So you can see this one is a for block C, it's a typical stay and uh, precast double wall connection. So what we have done is um, you can see this double wall um, as a both reinforcement layer in an outer cell then in the core. We did a few blockouts at certain center um, as per well, um, Austral advice where the precast can be transported and um, installed um, temporary for the temporary condition vertically. Then we did a um, blockout. Then between the blockout, we, what we have done is uh, install the U bar before infill this um, uh, uh, crowding uh, in the core of the double wall. Once you infill the um, core, then it comes like a normal RC wall. So blockout type D is the sideway connection with the cast in ferrule of the stair flights. Uh, mainly is uh, this we provided for the support stability of the stair and the cast walls. And again, this is the detail double wall to infill um, connection detail, um, infill slab um, connection detail. So you can see the door opening, then um, clearly so that all um, typical, you know, as per in situ door, door header beam detail with the um, close ties and uh, horizontal reinforcement. And the L bar coming from that um, um, inner core. Um, in a core uh, at site, you have to install at site. Then you can see the other uh, outer cell um, continue to the top of the slab level, thus eliminating foam work during the slab uh, pouring. Then you all will install um, all closed ties around the core walls to, uh, for as required for the earthquake or lateral load to transfer effectively from the main floor slab frame to the core walls. So now is uh, um, how we reviewed or time to time we change the detailing uh, of based on the hostel precast double wall soap rowing. So th they were during this um, soap rowing process, we had a lot of discussion with the hostel double wall and few times since the detail um, depend on the connectivity and transport of issues and um, construction issue at site. So Austral, uh, Austral precast again produced um, soap drawing with the uh, floor plans and sewing the panel break depend on the um, weight of the panel and um, ability to transport to the site and uh, um, crane in to the site. So this is a typical um, elevations uh, produced in the soap drawing. You can see um, clearly everything shows connection and the stair and where the slab levels and all um, temporary per permanent penetration and um, block out for the slab connectivity or stay landing connectivity. This is some um, detailed rowing of the um, typical panels showing again the block out, permanent penetration where required for the services or door opening and um, stay block out. And this is the um, same panels, but with the reinforcement layout, you can see all reinforcement and all reinforcement uh, continue through the all block out as with the two layers um, as by SAP drawing. And this is a typical uh, link beam detail or over the door head. And you can see your closed ties installed within, with both cell connecting both inner and outer cell. So this is um, uh, this also uh, produced uh, like a soap drawing by Austral with showing all 
full height of the precast elevation and temporary propping as required as style on site to be installed. This is uh, their part of the um, design and the construction of that um, double wall precast panel. There. So they bring the panels and install and provide temporary propping until the precast panel or double walls are tied into the main infill slab. This is um, another, for example, of another uh, stay around stay core, um, the precast um, double wall panel floor plants. Uh, typical elevation, you can see the permanent penetration and with the old rimmer bar as required. And this is a um, block out for the stay landing at certain interval. Um, this is a block out for the infill slab at the, at the floor levels. The other elevation uh, with a door opening uh, and uh, permanent penetration for the services. This uh, again, the detail reinforcement detail um, we reviewed as per our SAP drawing and um, exactly the same as by SAP drawing, just to make sure that all reinforcement are followed in. So I didn't show all the wall elevations, but this, these are the typical things. So this is again is a connection detail time to time. We discuss with hostel and updated um, typical connection detail. So this is the first one is the typical connection of the double wall with a, either lift or stair base. What we did, because I said this is a 220 thick panel, but if you when you go to the bigger um, or thicker panel, probably there's a space to provide two layer of reinforcement starter bar. What we came up with a closer spacing and install N20 single layer of vertical starter bar. Then they what, what then they will bring that the double wall then insert um, install into in the between the starter bar and for the inner core. Just note that all concrete strength um, will be followed as per original SAP design. This is the other typical um, floor um, panel slab connections. Um, at the, you can see that um, the outer cell is continuous, so that's reducing or eliminating the requirement of the formwork for the this slab at the edge. Then what you do then. Other things you can clearly see all reinforcement continue through these all pocket provided at the certain spacing. So at side, then what you do, you install the U bar as required or as per our SCP detail before pouring or infill that inner core and slab. This is a plan of um, um, corner of the connective corner of the double wall and T junction of the double wall. At the corner, you, what you do, you bring the install one panel, then insert this all L bar uh, for the connectivity um, at certain spacing. Uh, we did at 150 closer spacing and before installing our other panel. Same, same procedure here is a straight bar and again L bar for the T junction connectivity. These, these bar were installed or installed at site during um, Insulation of the panels, but before core filling uh, in in the core. Again, the same um, term at uh, top level is the connection detail. Um, so you can see the termination L bar at the top level of the slab, where the slab continue um, through the double wall both side. So here then again one side of the slab termination, and you can see the U bar and L bar coming from in the core of them. All these are installed at site. And again, and the outer cell continue to the top of the slab level, thus eliminating the requirement of the foam work. So again, this one, um, as I said before, is a sideway connection of the stair flight with a, uh, one of the cell um, with the cast in ferrule. 
So these are uh, some of the photos uh, how it was um, constructed uh, or fabricated at site the panels um, at Hostel Yard. This is completion um, this, uh, showing that uh, the reinforcement arrangement. So again, the reinforcement exactly following as per the soap rowing. You can see that clearly. Same detail. So the, these are the, some of the photos that were taken um, at site during the construction. You can see the full height panel standing with the temporary propping before that second level or suspended level um, go in here in the infill. And install the full height uh, before um, infill the inner core. This is a blockout. Um, you can see with the polystyrene blockout and the old reinforcement uh, continuity of the old reinforcement. You can see clearly. So the uh, installation of the um, so in some photo installation of the double wall at the lift stair base. You can see a vertical bar uh, coming from the base. In some photos. While taking uh, insulation was in progress, where the wall elevations, you can see this panel with the door opening and um, as installed. Um, yeah, just um, just I want to make you can see some temporary um, the strengthening element here that was um, designed and detailed by Hostel uh, for the transportation and insulation. Uh, until all slab are put in in place. So what they did, they, they as we we have a lot of penetration and the block out, um, they provided a temporary strengthening um, um, steel members uh, to so that way that so they can transport the save the panels safely to site and install. You can see some of the elements here, the vertical elements um, continue through that uh, things to strengthen that panels for the temporary conditions. So this is uh, during the construction uh, symbol to typical slab infill. You can see all reinforcement continue. You can see that vertical reinforcement of the precast panels and horizontal and tie and L bar coming from the panels. Some more detail um, before infill, then you can see that about the door opening or L bar comes and a U tie bar for the proper connectivity of the slab with the double wall precast panels. In further detail, um, some of the photos showing clearly. This is an inside um, view of uh, stair core. So this is um, a top view image. Um, you can see these two co standing out um, as installed before pouring infill slab. This is again um, two steco. Um, that's assembly area, as we said. Steco standing out before pouring infill slab, and these are the insulation of the lightweight steel roof framing. So it's um, uh, mainly what are the creativity or innovation and challenges what we face during the construction. So SCP proposed the use of full height double wall um, precast in collaboration with the hostel precast as core walls, which allowed the construction um, of infill small slab area to be built later stage, um, but, or, but with the same time with the double wall insulation. But, um, the stage one construction were able to start very quickly, not relying on the core wall construction. However, more importantly, unlike um, the conventional construction where walls are typically constructed period to slab, then providing a lateral rest into the floor slab. But in this case, um, you know, the floor slab is um, um, not followed by 
conventional framework because of the alta flow system you install you um install uh, you construct the columns then install the mega beam and secondary um alta flow beams then the alta flow forms between the secondary beams thus eliminating normal conventional form conventional formwork it means you wouldn't have any normal scaffolding underneath thus um, no no any bracing for the floor slab so in consideration that we what we did we provided a temporary bracing system to the columns um, until all core walls are poured and tied in and also um, as i said uh, previously we did a few precast uh, rockla columns um, uh, it's uh, around 12 meter height um, and installed in two three days uh, thus eliminating uh, scaffolding procedure and you know conventionally form to the full height and pouring difficulty so this is uh, some completed building uh, you can see some photos uh, here a photo from inside with the landscape this is a triple height um, precast columns as i said earlier then is an assembly area some more photos again some classroom layout whole layout top view classroom layout that's um, end of my presentation. Um, I will. I would like to thank um, Engineers Australia on behalf of SCP Consulting for providing this opportunity to make this presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ravi, for your presentation. Um, it's now your turn to get involved. Uh, Murray and Ravi will come together as a panel. Um, to take questions from our audience. I see that we've already had quite a few questions and I'd like to thank David Pervin, who's the account manager at Austral Precast for being so proactive and answering so many questions in the chat box. Um, please send your questions for the panel via the chat box uh, on the screen, ensuring you provide your name and who the question is for, if that's your preference. Um, we do have some questions already, and I'd like to put a question from Debbie. Uh, Debbie is asking, what is the advantage of designing a double wall precast panel versus a traditional panel or sandwich panel? And rather, you've just been talking, so maybe um, Murray, you'd like to, Matthew, you'd like to pick that one up. Um, anyway. Okay, so. Basically, the advantage for designing in double wall is versus a sandwich panel is that um, double wall is a essentially two two skins of precast with the in situ core fill, which with the girder makes it a monolithic uh, construction. Um, a sandwich panel has the insulation, and so essentially is a internal facade panel, sorry, external facade panel insulation, then the internal um, structural panel. So. Double wall can actually be made with insulation on one of the shells, so we can actually have it as a um, as a sandwich panel. The main advantage of double wall is that the way to actually manufacture the panel is easier in the factory for making sandwich panels versus traditional sandwich panels, and also that the um, the connections are simpler because of the concrete core fill connecting to the reinforcement rather than um, having fixed mechanical connections as you would with uh, typical solid wall construction. Thank you for that. Um, Ravi, do you want to comment on that at all? Uh, yeah, it's, as uh, Matthew said, uh, mainly it is eliminating, you know, the um, uh, stitch plate connection or uh, that's a or wet connection. So this is an um, all re corner reinforcement of T-Youngs and installed and poured together that at the end it's becomes a uh, like an instinct to war. Thank you. Um, we've had a question around compliance that's coming from Brendan, who's uh, in Victoria. Uh, Brendan is asking, um, he's directed the question to Ravi, is all design being carried out in full compliance with AS 
2018? Uh, the public school based on 2009. So that, that's the reason you, um, we with it all, you can see in our detailing a single uh, corner junction L bar detailing. But now it's, uh, I, I believe the material is uh, already updated um, based on 2018, the detailed connection with the boundary elements. Yes, that's correct, Ravi. Um, so essentially, we can achieve the requirements for confinement of boundary elements and such for to meet the seismic requirements. Um, this just means a slight change to the way that we do the connection. So typically, for a simple wall, we might just have, say, a mesh uh, connecting from panel to panel. Whereas with the um, changes for 3600-2018, if, if the shear uh, force requires us to uh, have confinement, um, then we'll essentially put a U-bar in, in the uh, precast going from panel from shell to shell and put either a U-bar or a stirrup on site to connect from panel to panel to complete the connection. All these details are available in our technical manual as well as on the website. Thank you, Matthew. Um, we have a question um, from Hassan in Victoria asking, what is the maximum number of floors that can be constructed using this precast panel system? And he's directed that to you, Ravi. Uh, for my understanding, it's, it's not, uh, it, you know, at the end, it's uh, when it's in the core is poor, then um, if exactly if they follow the reinforcement, what consultant saw, then it can, pour, it can go um, as far as, how many story doesn't matter, but maybe it's a um, barrier is maybe it's a transportation or a crane in and um, panel size and crane in the building. Um, Matthew, you want to advise on that? Uh, yeah, so essentially <clears throat> for double, we typically are limited. The major, major limitation for us is how much reinforcement we can get into the panel and the core. So the, um, the precast shells that we manufacture, we're limited to N16, 100 bar mat, 100 mil uh, spacing for our bar mat each face, each way. And also um, when it comes to the core, whilst we have say a maximum thickness of 400 millimeters with our 70 mil uh, shells, that leaves us essentially 260 mils for the core. And so for that to get double layer of reinforcement, um, we're just limited, limited by the size of that minus about 15 mil on each side so that the panels can obviously uh, go over the starters on site and have continuity of concrete around it. So that's the major limitation. Um, we also can pour our panels in our factory currently using a 65 MPA concrete, um, which will then obviously increase the compressive strength of the wall. Thank you, Matthew. And while you're there, um, we've had a question about uh, lifespan. And the question is, um, is the lifespan of precast the same as brick wall or is it actually more? Uh, I'm not actually an expert in bricks, you know, I work for Brickworks, um, but I, I'd imagine for, for currently we're doing designs for projects for 100 year lifespan um, using AS5100 uh, design uh, procedures. So some of the infrastructure projects um, here in Sydney to achieve 100 years. Um, Bricks, I would, I would have to uh, get back to you on that one. Thank you. Um, we have a question that's been asked, asked a few times um, and Pradeep has put this forward um, to either speaker who wants to pick this up, um, asking, did you say double wall can be used as shear wall? Will you install the confinement inside wall? Matthew? Yeah, uh, yes. Yep. I can take that one. Yeah, we can use double wall for shear walls. And um, so essentially we have some details for doing double wall, for instance, with a cage, uh, which is not our preference for manufacture, but we can essentially put a whole cage into a panel if we want to. Um, but our other way of doing it is essentially to have the bar mats with uh, U-bar at, at the end of the walls for confining the boundary elements closest to the end of the, end of the wall and then also providing a tie from shell to shell so that we essentially for, from each bar mat, we'd put the second bar mat in the, on top of the girders when we're doing the first pour so that we can get the tie incorrectly. 
so that section then actually makes it comply with AS 3600. Thank you, Matthew. Ravi, do you want to comment on that? Uh, that that's fine. Matthew already answered, uh, so that's it. That's good. I'm sort of taking this back to the beginning. Um, we've had a question from Seeming who is asking, what are the key deciding factors to use double wall for a project? And he's directed that to Matt. Oh, okay, I'll go there. I'll be take that one because he helped with the decision oh. for his project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I can also answer for the as um, as my, um, I said in my presentation for the mainly eliminate the formwork and um, can be installed um, later stage and um, that's um, it eliminate um, site um, construction so bringing that to quite faster construction it help uh, quickly do the finish the construction mainly. Thank you. And while you're there, Ravi, we've had a yeah. question from um, Hilton, who is asking, could techniques and details for your innovative building be applied to the construction of sports stadiums? Uh, depend on the layout of the building, yes. Um, if the, but depend on, again, in the load, I, I think the Alta flow is uh, limited to um, quite um, to uh, 3 KPLI load. Um, normal infill slab and things, but um, then it's a 15 meter mega beam. So it's depend on the floor layout. Yes, it can be used, um, I would say. Thank you. Um, Ernesto is asking us, um, how do you detect and avoid formation of voids in cores? Uh, Matt, do you okay. want to pick that up? Sure. So when we manufacture double wall, um, each of the precast shells is vibrate, vibrated on the table. So the pallet is actually vibrates to eliminate any voids in the precast section itself. Uh, once we go to site, we use a typically a 10 mil aggregate high slump or self compacting mix. Um, so typically a 180 mil slump or higher. And if there's a lot of concerns, the self compacting mix is the is also available. Um, the other thing to note is because most of the reinforcement is actually already covered by concrete in the precast section, there is limited number of um, possibilities for that actually for voids to occur. So we see much better um, consistency of, of the concrete in the core in, com in comparison to other construction methods. Thank you for that. Um, we've now had a question coming from a client perspective from Kevin. Uh, Kevin is asking, what are the key advantages of the double wall that I convince my clients to use it over the Dinsel wall for basement wall particular, in particular? So the keys, the keys there of using double wall versus the other systems are speed, quality, and consistency. So also, as, and also, which is for all clients, price. So we are competing um, directly with Dinsel in the base wall applications. Um, so if we have a 200 mil thick uh, wall, as some of you are probably may be aware, 200 mil thick from other products is not actually um, watertight. So it requires extra waterproofing behind the wall. If you want to go to a waterproof system where essentially you eliminate the use of, of waterproofing, um, the other systems require a 270 mil, 275 mil thick wall. With double wall, we can achieve that with a 250 mil thick wall. So one of the key advantages to uh, waterproofing is, um, I don't know if you guys saw the detail there, where we had the bottom shutter at a different height to the, uh, to the, in, to the external shutter. And you can actually let, put the panels in before you pour the slab. And with that, you get continuity of concrete from the slab into the Base, base of the wall and eliminate any cold joints, which is the, um, the number one cause of uh, waterproofing issues. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question from South Australia from Hype, um, and this is around the firewall uh, fire rating. And Hype's asking, what is the product's fire rating and can it be used for application for firewall or transformer in substation? So for fire ratings, um, it's straight out of AS3600 because it's a concrete wall. 
So all of our panels will achieve a minimum two hour fire rating um, as they're 180 mil thick, 180 mil in overall thickness. Uh, to achieve a four hour fire rating, we have to go to a 250 mil thick wall and make sure we have the reinforcement, I believe it to be at, uh, it's at 45, 45 or 55 millimeters as the main vertical reinforcement from the base. Um, if there's anything extra that you require for substations in particular, please email us um, some questions or even give me a call uh, tomorrow and be happy to discuss it with you. Thank you, Matt. And from fire to water, um, Lexcon is, is mentioning that uh, a water tank was included in an earlier presentation and asking, was it taken to comply with AS3735? Yes. So we can design it to find AS3735. Um, we've got applications that we've seen overseas for different um, water treatment plants and such. Uh, here we've done the, a tank for AW Edwards for Equinex for their data center. And we're actively trying to get into um, the OSD tank market at the moment. So I think that's a very good application for double. Thank you, Matt. Um, we've got a question from Kevin. Um, Kevin is asking, can the two panels be connected in a different angle instead, instead of 90 degrees? Um, Ravi, do you want to take that one? Uh, so two different panel, um, 90 degrees. Yeah, it can be connected um, if it dip, if the wall um, is, um, two walls are not in 90 degree then, um, but um, only the issue is uh, Matthew has to answer whether it can be fabricated uh, in the yard with the, the that we, angle shape of the connective connection. Uh, we, we definitely can. Um, so for any walls that are, have an included angle of 100, 165 degrees or greater, so essentially from straight to 15 degrees off, off of being straight, um, there's basically no modification to the wall at all, except for the length of the shutter. So the external shutter will be slightly longer than the internal one. Um, once we go above that, 160 or below that 165 degrees, say to 135 degrees, we would put a splay edge onto the panel um, in, all, in, all, in order to make the angle. So it's definitely achievable and we can do fixed connections or hinge connections um, at those angles, depending upon what you need. Thank you for that. We've had an interesting question come through from Pratik, who is asking, has this method of construction been used in marine structures? In, in a marine environment, the required thickness of walls are generally higher than in the buildings. Any restriction on the thickness of the wall? So for double wall, the, our standard thicknesses go from 180 millimetres up to 400 millimetres. And that's limited by the, essentially by the girder uh, or the truss machine manufacturers as their largest size. Above that, um, we can use double wall, but as a, what we call a, a single wall system. So essentially two halves of double wall can be joined through the use of a um, formwork Z bar or tie to separate the wall. So we've done walls to greater thicknesses of say seven, six, 700 millimeters if required. And that becomes then the, the limiting factor for determining on how we put that in on the site. Thank you for that. And we've just time for a, a couple more questions. And thank you, we've had so many questions come through both on pre-registration and live. But we have an interesting question from um, Mehran, who says, thank you, Matt and Ravi. Could you tell me whether the total weight of structures with double walls are higher or lower than the structures with conventional walls? And Ravi, you might want to kick off with that. Uh, yeah, what we are Originally, we designed 200 thick wall, uh, but then we changed to 220 thick wall for the, uh, to maintain the hostel requirement for the outer cell and inner, inner cell uh, 70 mm minimum and the outer cell, I think, uh, 75 or 80. That's only, so I said they, they were, yes, 20 mm thickness increase from in situ to double wall. Uh, Matt, do you want to comment on that? 
Yeah, I think um, we can essentially have the same overall mass as compared to a traditional structure, but I think there can probably also be more gains made in the design um, compared to our current, to, compared to what we currently see a lot of coming through where we have the core walls doing a lot of work. Um, double wall enables us to make shear walls quite quickly and easily. And as such, um, by utilizing the footprint of the building and the shear walls, we could actually probably reduce the, um, the size and reinforcement requirements in the cores. So I think that would be um, quite an interesting uh, design application to look at, whereby getting the, the walls and due to their geometry and size to do more of the work or to take up more of the work than, than we see in a lot of buildings currently. Thank you. And we sort of almost run out of time, so I'll direct this question just to you, Matt, uh, from Talal, who's asking, can double walls be used in curved areas? In, in curved areas? Uh, yes, we can do double as a curve, but typically, unlike, unfortunately, unlike a complete curve because of the manufacturing process, we would do double to make a faceted curve. Um, so essentially, keeping the curve or the panel to panel joint less than 15 degrees makes it uh, quite simple to achieve the curve. Um, but it just has to be known that it will be a, a flattened curve, so to speak, with the faceted face. Thank you for that. And once again, thank you for all these um, questions that's come through. What we will do is that we'll look to answer all of the questions and send that out with the, um, with the CPD certificate in the next few days. Um, that's all the time we have for tonight. And please join me again in thanking Ravi and Matt for great presentations. I'm sure you'll agree they've shared some great insights uh, tonight with us. Um, once again, I'd like to thank our industry partner, Austral Precast, for making tonight's webinar possible. On behalf of Engineers Australia, I'd like you all, uh, thank you all for attending tonight's uh, webinar and look forward to seeing you virtually at our next event. Thank you.